Well, Jesus, we have prayed, we have talked about this, and so if this is, okay, maybe, maybe this is the issue. Okay, I think maybe it's just the first slide. Okay, okay, we have people, fantastic. Thank you, Lord. So, so here is our series. This, this is the series that, that we're going to be here for a few weeks. How did we get here? I really, I really love this title. I'm, I'm, I'm appreciative for Pastor Felipe, who was inspired to create this title for the series, because I think it really articulates what we're trying to do. Let me first start by saying here what we are not trying to do. Here's what we're not trying to do. We are not trying to make one group of people feel good at the expense of another group of people. That's not what we're trying to do. This is not an opportunity for uh, us, myself, Pastor Felipe, or whoever, to kind of bash and, and beat on any personal, uh, any racial group, any ethnic group, um, and to create guilt and shame and pain just for the sake of it. That's not what we're trying to do. We recognize that talking about issues of race creates strong emotions, especially for those who have been the victims of racism, and that in this way, it can be, it can be a triggering experience. We understand that. And so we want to be very careful with our language and our approach that we do not unintentionally re-injure, re-wound, re-offend people who have been dealing with this their entire lives. But we also don't want to be silent and avoid the conversation. And I recognize that there are many, not, not necessarily literally watching, but, but metaphorically watching the church, watching the Adventist church, watching North Shore Adventist church, and wondering, what do we say? What do we believe? Where do we stand on these issues? And so, by God's grace, we want to take the time to carefully unpack what Scripture says and also talk about some of the his historical and present realities that feed into this concept of race and faith under the sense of trying to understand how we got here. Because we believe if we can understand how we got here, then perhaps we can understand where God is leading and taking us to. So... I want to start with scripture, Isaiah 58, verse 1 to 4. Isaiah 58, verse 1 to 4, the New King James Version says this, Cry aloud, spare not, lift up your voice like a trumpet, tell my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Just in case it is not clear, it is the responsibility of men and women who stand for God, and especially those who stand behind the sacred desk, to declare specifically to God's people when there is transition, transgression and when there is sin. Now, this is not comfortable. <laughs> for those of you who have spent any time uh, in, in, in public communication, you know that you never want to offend your audience. That's like rule number one. But when we stand behind the sacred desk, our audience is actually God himself. He is the one who preachers, teachers, leaders must be accountable to. And while it is never the intention to upset or hurt people necessarily, when it comes to declaring the truth, we must, as the Bible says, stand. Verse 2, it says, they seek me daily speaking about God's people, and delight to know my ways as a nation that did righteousness and did not forsake the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinance of justice. They delight in approaching God. Isaiah here is describing a nation, a group of people who they actually like to worship God. They come to worship God. They, they, they are reaching out for God, but they are confused because even though they, they worship God, they pray, they fast, they read, they come to church, they do all of these things as if they are righteous, yet something is not quite right. God does not seem to be reacting to them in the way that they would like. It continues in verse 3. They say, why have we fasted and you have not seen? Why have we afflicted our souls and you take no notice? And then here comes the answer. In fact, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure and exploit all your laborers. 
Indeed, you fast for strife and debate and to strike with the fist of wickedness. You will not fast as you do this day to make your voice heard and high. God is saying to his people, listen, I see that you are sincere in your desire to know me and be blessed by me, but there are some issues in your midst that you have to deal with before your prayers and your fasting will be heard. One of these issues, the way you treat your laborers. Another of these issues, the fact that when you are fasting, really what you're wanting power for is to be able to defeat the opposition in the debate, not really to know me. And God is saying, if you continue to fast like this, you will not be heard in high. Let's go to another text. Second Chronicles. Chapter 7, verse 14. Well-known passage. <clears throat> Let me find it here. Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. Here's what the Bible says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Here Solomon on the day when the temple was, Solomon's temple was consecrated, was inspired to tell the people, when stuff happens in your society, he says when God shuts up heaven, which is actually an echo to what happened in the time of Elisha, Elijah, right? But when God shuts up heaven and there's no rain, or when there's a famine, or when there's a plague, or when there's a plague, like, when there's a sickness going around in your society that can't be cured, if my people, God says, that are called by my name will first humble themselves. Humility here is speaking to pausing to stop to think, Lord, could we be in the wrong? Could it be that there's something that has happened that we have either done or not done that you are unhappy with that we need to address? If they would humble themselves, Solomon says, and if they would pray and if they would seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. In order to turn from your wicked ways, you have to first look back at your ways. As David said, search me and try me, O Lord, and see if there be any wicked way in me. And then lead me in the way everlasting. The Bible says if they do that, then God will hear, and then he will forgive, and then he will heal their land. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying that coronavirus is the punishment and judgment of God, like that God sat up in heaven and was like, hmm, who can, I, who can I sick today with coronavirus? But I am saying that the things that we experience in our world, the emotional, the physical, the mental, the spiritual trauma we experience in our world, is the result of in many cases of human actions. And while we pray to God for healing and deliverance and forgiveness, but we don't address the cause of those actions, we may be praying in vain. So we must look at our ways. It's biblical to look at our ways. All right. I want to, I want to play a video for you. Let me just set this up. This is a video of a, um, a man called Lester Maddox, Governor Lester Maddox, and there will be a question, there will be a mentee question after the video. Just to set it up, Governor Left the Maddox, this is happening on December the 18th, 1970. It is on a television show by a, a talk show host called Dick Cavett. I believe I'm saying his name correctly. And Governor Maddox is debating with a football player, Jim Brown, on the issues of race, segregation, and things of that nature. So watch the video, just a couple minutes, and then we will come back. racism to mean, or how would you define that, or segregation? Uh, are, would you say you're a segregationist? Uh, yes, and I believe, uh, in my term, or, or my definition of segregation, and uh, uh, that is, uh, a segregation is a person that loves his race enough, or other races enough, has enough of racial pride and integrity to want to preserve them. <clears throat> and I think a racist is one that doesn't care enough for his race or another race to where they would 
don't care whether they're amalgamated or destroyed or not. <laughs> no, I, I think uh, I think that forced racial segregation is criminal and unconstitutional, and I think forced racial integration is criminal and unconstitutional. I think either one of them is, is cruel. You mean on by a social? Force. You mean on a social level? Any level, if it, where it's forced. <clears throat> well, we do have like uh, the laws. You mean when the laws are enforced, that if it involves uh, integration, then it is wrong. If it forces people against their will, against denying them their choice to then you separate mean there or to be, integrate. There should be an It'd exception. be just as wrong if, it, if the law would be just as wrong to, to force them to integrate as it would to be to force them to segregate. Well, don't you? If a country can finally get to the point of saying, well, you're going to hire this person, you're going to promote this person, you're going to serve this person, or you, then the country, <clears throat> same country can come right around and tell you, going, you've got to work for that person, you've got to eat with that person, you've got to be served by that person. And this would be cruel and wrong, but so it is when it tells another person that you've got to do this. Believe it or not, I don't think that integration should be the number one thrust of uh, uh, our civil rights leaders anyway, because I think what we're really talking about in this country is economic development of black people, because I've found Economic that, development of all people. Well, we're talking about underprivileged well, How come you have people. black people? How we're come you don't want to do it for well, black I'll, people? How come you don't want to do it for white people? I'll tell you why. Huh? I'll tell how you why. How come you don't want to do it for everybody? How come you always black give, people? Why don't you talk about all people? Can I give you an answer? Huh? I think can we I understand give, the please. question. <laughs> yeah. Can I give you an answer? <laughs> do you mind? Now, go ahead. If you're ready, I'll give you time. <laughs> okay, go on. Uh, what I'm really saying is that there are some people that have suffered in this country, poor people generally, but let's say that uh, we have various ethnic groups in this country that have attained a certain kind of equality. Black people are more or less, along with the Indians, uh, on the last rung oh. of the ladder. Can I finish, Governor? Boy. Can I finish? <laughs> okay, do you mind? All right, we can, you can stop it there. <clears throat> so this is, this is a, clip, a clip that I created. Um, if, if you want to see the full thing, you go to YouTube and you just Google uh, Governor Lester Maddox and uh, his interview with um, Dick Cavett. <clears throat> I don't know if you were paying attention, I hope the sound quality was good. If you were paying attention to the statements or the arguments that the governor, he's the governor of Georgia, by the way, governor of the state of Georgia in the 1970s, that he was articulating. He said that segregation to him is, a, is having enough racial pride Loving your race and loving other races enough that you want to preserve them. And he says in his estimation, racism or a racist is a person who doesn't love their race or doesn't love other races to the point that they don't mind uh, amalgamating them. That's his term. He goes on to say that he believes... That and he uses some, some verbal gymnastics here, but he believes that forced segregation is wrong, is, is equally wrong, and forced integration is equally wrong. He said, no, it, we, you know, the, the government shouldn't get involved in, in forcing people to integrate or segregate. And this is, of course, in the 1970s, so this is five years or so after the passing of civil rights laws here in the USA, and he is still arguing for the continuation of the experience of segregation, certainly in his state, but one would argue in the South in general, based on this idea that the government shouldn't force people against their choice. And then as you notice towards the end, uh, Jim Brown then starts to articulate, listen, you know, integration is good, but that's not the main goal of the civil rights movement. The main goal is, to, is talking about economic development for black people. And you notice that as soon as he mentions that phrase, what, is, what does Governor Lester Maddox immediately say? He says, all people. All people. Why, why are you saying just black people? Economic development for all people. And then Jim Brown very patiently just asks, can I, can I finish? Can I explain? And he starts to explain again, and he starts to explain, well, the reason why I'm saying this is because in this country, in our history, there has been different experiences by different ethnic groups. And he starts to try to explain that in this country, black people have experienced something different. And as soon as he says that, the governor interrupts and says, phooey, as if like, oh, that's just ridiculous. That's not true. Now, here's, here's my question. Get, on, get in your device. 
Here's my question. Is this racism? Just answer the question. Yes, no, not sure. What we saw there from Governor Maddox, would you describe this as racism? Okay, we've got, we got a couple people, two, three. I want to give you some more time. Okay, I want to, I want to, this is important because you're going to set up something later in the message. Now, only three have responded. That could mean that only three are on their device. Uh, that could mean that only three are, are watching. Some, someone says, no, I don't think that is racism. A couple people are saying, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. <clears throat> All right. The vast majority of people here are saying, yes, this is clear and obvious racism. Certainly, uh, maybe there's another way of framing this. Can you imagine this same conversation debate happening today on Jimmy Fallon? Because Dick Cavett is like a 70s equivalent. Can you imagine Jimmy Fallon sitting down with a current athlete, let's, let's say LeBron James, and having somebody else on the show who's making the same arguments? I, I, I think it would be difficult to, to see that. But anyhow, okay? A couple say no. Five, not sure. The majority say yes. All right, let's keep going. The question then is, what is racism? If this is racism, the question I want to pose is why? Why is this racism? Okay, so what is racism? Let's, let's, let's move on. Okay, here is a definition from the Webster Dictionary. Got it from the, uh, from, from the website you can see there. There are three different definitions that are given, but I want to start with the third of the definitions first, because I think when we talk about racism, this is what most people think of, and, and this is how we mostly feel. Racism is racial prejudice or discrimination. In other words, in the, by this definition, racism is like being mean to people of a different race. Okay? So that would be, you know, black people being mean to Latinos. That's racist. Saying nasty things, making funny words and noises. Or, or Latino people being mean and prejudiced to Filipinos. That would be, we call that racism. Or uh, white people being mean to Koreans. This is how we usually use the term racism in our society, and, and certainly that is a true definition of it. That is a true definition of it. Um, and often when we think of racism, we think of people like this. Remember a few years back in, 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 in uh, Charlottesville, um, there was this protest, and this man was, was, was famously pictured with his tiki torch, just shouting in his anger and frustration, so we assumed, about the state of the country and the fact that there weren't enough rights and considerations for men like him. And easily, all of us could point to that and say, ah, oh, yes, racism, that's it, that's right there. And so if we can get rid of these people, we'll be fine. This is how we often define racism. But here's the thing, if racism is primarily or only about prejudice and discrimination, and therefore a matter of the heart, then the only difference I can make is in myself. Let me read that one more time. If racism is primarily or only about prejudice, that means preferring one group or another, discrimination, that means not wanting to hang out with some group and like, you know, pushing some group to the side, which obviously is wrong, if it's only about that, then it's a matter of the heart, right? If, if you have that in your heart, then that's wrong. And if I have that in my heart, then that's wrong. And therefore, the only difference I can make is in myself. I can hope to become the nicest, kindest, lovingest, most open, most generous, you know, most equal opportunity person I can be. That's all I can do. All I can do is control myself and maybe pray for you that somehow God would help your heart. But here are the other definitions of racism. Number one and two in Webster's Dictionary. <clears throat> racism, a belief that race, hear this carefully, Holy Spirit, help him right now. The belief that race is the primary determinant of human traits and capacities. 
It is the concept, the idea that a person's traits, that means how they are, their personality, their attitude, their, 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 their tendencies, and their capabilities, their intelligence, their athletic gifts, their, 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 their memory abilities, their whatever, are pr the primary, the primary determinant of that is their race. That's the first definition. Now notice this definition has nothing to do with being mean, saying bad words, laughing at memes that you shouldn't laugh at. It has nothing to do with that. It's about how you think about not just others, but also yourself. Right? Okay, that's number one. Number two, second definition. I'm oh, sorry, it's a continuation. And that racial differences produce an inherent superiority of a particular race, right? If, if, if one believes that the primary source of a, of a person's capabilities and tendencies is their race, and if we live in a society where we value certain tendencies, then by definition, it creates a ranking and there will be a superiority, by definition. Not, not, not because I feel good or I feel bad or because I hate one or I love the other, but if that's how we set out the construct, necessarily one group will have more of the traits and capabilities that we like right now and another group will have less if that's how we think of it and if that's true. This is the first definition of racism. Okay, next. The second is a doctrine or political program based on the assumption of racism and designed to execute its principles. So the second definition is, if we assume that number one is true, now just think it through. If it really is the case that there are some people who because of their race have certain traits and qualities that we want, shouldn't any wise government create programs and policies to make sure that those people have more access to the things that will benefit the society? Conversely, if we believe that there are some groups of people that have traits and tendencies based on their race that are not desirable, wouldn't it make sense to create a system in which we don't allow them to have access to things that could ultimately mess up the society? Friends, you discriminate like this all the time in your family. When your children were three, how many of you let them play with knives? How many of you are like, listen, equal opportunities. If my three-year-old baby wants a knife, girl, kids power, we're going to give them that. Of course you didn't. Why not? Because you're like, listen, there is something about being three that biologically, scientifically means you don't have the capacity to handle dangerous objects. You're wonderful. We love you. In fact, if anything, we love you more. But we're not going to let you play with the knives. And that's good parenting. That also happens to be biologically true and also happens to be biblically founded. The question is, is the same true about race? Because if it is, then it doesn't make sense to let races that don't have the qualities you need be in situations where they will not benefit the society. That's, that's in many ways just, just logic. Okay, let's move, let's move forward. All right. Finally, it's the political or social system founded on racism. So... How did we get here? This is what we're trying to answer the question. If this is the definition of racism, how did we get here? Second question, does racism exist in the Bible? Based on these definitions that we have just found, and the answer is kind of yes or no. Let me, let me see if I can show you very quickly. If you turn in your Bible to the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 12, verse 1 to 2. Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 to 2, and then 9 and 10. This is probably the best example, the example most cited when people look to speak about racism or discrimination or prejudice as it occurs in Scripture. Verse 1 says, Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses. Okay, pause. This is after coming out of Egypt, after going through the Red Sea, after all of that good stuff. Okay? Uh, they spoke against Moses. Notice the, notice the text. Because he was a bad leader? No. Because his sermons were too long and they were missing out on lunch, might be a good reason to speak up, but that's not what was mentioned. Because they didn't like that, you know, only he could make decisions? No. It says, because of the Ethiopian woman whom he had married. 
for he had married an Ethiopian woman. So his brother and sister, Moses, that's the Moses of the Ten Commandments, the Moses who's held, held up as the, 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 the greatest leader of, of, of the Israelite people, the Moses who was on the Mount of Transfiguration with, with, with Jesus. That Moses had a situation in his own family where his brothers and sisters were speaking about him to other people, grumbling about him, and their motivation, according to the Bible, inspired by the Holy Spirit, their motivation was that he had married an Ethiopian. Now, of course, the Bible does not specifically say that she, it doesn't mention her race. This is an, eth, this is an ethnic or national uh, a term here, but we can assume that she was someone perhaps of a darker hue than them, although, of course, as Palestines, they themselves would have been of a darker hue, amen, because they weren't Northern Europeans in Egypt and the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, we're good. But they had an issue that he had married this Ethiopian. Now, maybe it was just cultural. Maybe it was that bad. We're just not into that injera that she's trying to cook around mealtime. We're just, we're not, just not feeling that. I don't know. Maybe it was a colorism thing. Who knows? But all we're told is that they had an issue with his wife because she was Ethiopian. And now watch verse 2. So they said, oh, please, friends, don't miss this. The Bible tells us what their motive is. Now look what they actually say. So they said, has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. So their motive is something cultural, ethnic, whatever, but their language has got nothing to do with that. If you ask them, hey, do you hate Ethiopians? We don't hate Ethiopians. Listen, my sister-in-law is an Ethiopian. I just feel that we need different leadership at this time. But God heard it. Verse 9 and 10, look what happens. There's stuff I can't read, but read it in your own time. Verse 9 and 10. So the anger of the Lord was aroused. God gets upset he gets angry when he sees injustice. I'm going to say it on this side of the pulpit. God is emotionally disturbed. And he inspired the spirit to describe that emotion as anger when he sees injustice. So if you see other people who are angry about injustice... You might just be seeing an echo of the emotion of God. He was angry. And was, he was aroused against them. And he departed, verse 10, and went. So, so God left. Oh, help us, Lord. It was so upsetting to God that he's like, I can't hang out with you so-called chosen folk while this is going on. Verse 10. And when the cloud departed from above the tabernacle, suddenly Miriam became leprous. As white as snow, pause, if she already was white as snow, she couldn't become white as snow. This leprosy made her skin paler in patches, and Aaron turned towards Miriam, and there she was a leper. Okay, we don't have time to fully unpack this, but here's the point. This is an example in the Bible of clear prejudice, and clearly an example of how God feels about that. Clearly, there is overtones of colorism here. The question, though, is, is this racism? Please stay with me. Is this racism? Yes, there was prejudice. Yes, there was discrimination. Probably also colorism. That is the preference of certain shades of skin. But however, this is not technically, listen to that word, technically racism. Why am I saying technically? Because we have defined what racism is. And for there to be racism, there must first be race. Hopefully that makes sense with you. I hope, I hope this is not flying over too quickly. For there to be a race-ism, there must be first be race. And there are no races in the Bible. I need to say that very clearly. There are no races in the Bible. There is the human family of which Adam and Eve are the first parents and which Pastor Felipe reminded us last week that Paul says God has made us all from this same blood. But in the Bible, you will not find the term race to describe Caucasian, to describe black, to describe Asian, 
to describe it. You will not find those categories in Scripture. That you will find Egyptian, you will find, you know, uh, Amalekite, Azazanite, Econite. I'm just made, those, those last two are just made up. You'll find all the ites. And you'll find the Greeks and the and the and the and, and the, 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 the pagans and the Gentiles and the Hebrews, but you will not find races in the Bible. And so technically, this cannot be racism because you first need races. So then how did we get race? Let's first look at the definition of race, according to Webster's, Webster's dictionary as well. Here's the entry. A breeding stock of animals. That's the first way you can use the word. Second way. A family, tribe, people, or nation belonging to the, quote, same stock. B, a class or kind of people, hear this, unified by shared interests, habits, or characteristics. This is a definition here of race. Now, this is the definition. This is 2020, obviously, 2020. But here is the definition of race in the same Webster's Dictionary in 1913. Go, go home and Google it if you think I'm making this up. 1913, same Webster's, same word, race. What does it mean? Here's the definition. So this is in 1913, this is what the word race meant. I understand it means something different today. Words do shift meaning in time, over time. Here's what it meant in the turn of the century. The descendants of a common ancestor, a family, tribe, people, or nation believed or presumed to belong to the same, quote, stock, a lineage, a breed. How can I, how can I help you to understand this? Here's a question. I should have made a slide about this, but I didn't. Clearly, there are the, the scientific term is phenotypical, which means the way that things look. Clearly, there are differences in the ways that humans look. No one's denying that. This is not some we need to be race colorblind argument here. Clearly, there are differences between humans. The question is how do these differences arise? Or how are we different? Are we different like beagles are different? from bloodhounds. I'm not a dog person, forgive me. Uh, but but a, blood, a bloodhound, they're, they're both dogs, clearly. They can, they can breed, they can have kids. But a beagle is a distinct lineage breed of dog. And a beagle has distinct characteristics based on its breed. And if you want a dog that has certain kinds of characteristics of a beagle, then you ought to get a beagle. On the other hand, a, hand, a bloodhound is a different breed of dog. They're both dogs. They're equally dogs. No one is more a dog, less a dog. But, but certainly a bloodhound is a different kind of breed of dog. And maybe there may be size differences, color differences, smelling ability differences, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, between the breeds. Are humans like that? Or are humans like the differences within the group of beagles? So there are beagles. Some beagles happen to be big beagles. Some beagles happen to be small beagles. Some beagles happen to have longer hair. Some beagles happen to have shorter hair. Some beagles happen to be a little bit stronger. Other beagles happen to be a little bit weaker. Is that, is that how the differences between humans is distributed? Or is it the first way? In, the 19, in 1913 and before and after, they believed that the differences was like the difference between beagles and bloodhounds. That these different races were different breeds of humans. And if you think about it, you know this to be true based on language because you have heard the now not often hopefully used term to describe a person whose parents are of different race where they refer to that person as half... What? Breed. The concept that there are these fixed lineages and breeds or races. Now here's where it gets, here's where it gets more interesting. This is, this is a footnote in the same uh, Webster's Dictionary of 1913. It says this, naturalists, those are scientists who study nature, right? And ethnographers, those are scientists who study ethnicity. 
divide mankind into several distinct varieties or races. Uh, Kuvia refers to, to them all to refers them all to three. Pritchard enumerates seven. Uh, Gacy's eight. Pickering eleven. In other words, they disagree on how many they are. How many there are, right? But then he comes to this. Bloom, Blumenbach, who makes five, the Caucasian or white race, to which belong the greater part of the European nations and of those Western Asia. The Mongolian, and I'm reading the language in context, even though I understand that these words can be upsetting and offensive today. The or yellow race, occupying Tartary, China, Japan, etc. The Ethiopia, Ethiopian or Negro race, occupying most of Africa except the north. And why except the north? Because Egypt is there and there are pyramids there, and that hmm, that's, surely that can't work. So, except the north. Okay, let's keep going. Australasia, Papua, and other specific islands. The American or red race, comprising the Indians of North and South America, and the Malayan or brown race, which occupies the islands of the Indian archipelago, etc. This is Webster's Dictionary. This is what they mean when they're talking about race. Okay. Now, this man, Johann Blumenbach, German scientist of the 17, in 1700s, 1796, he came up with these categories. We kind of spoke about them, right? But I'm putting them on, on the screen, right? Before this, before Blumenbach, certainly people categorized themselves. Humans have always categorized themselves. But they did so tribally. What does that mean? Well, if we are all related, so in this town, in this village, in this section of the country, we can trace our lineage back to one common grandfather, great-grandfather, whoever, then we are the same tribe. And certainly, we don't like the tribe down the road. Man, the tribe down the road can eat rocks. But we're the fill-in-the-blank tribe. Humans have always done that, absolutely. Uh, linguistically, we've categorized ourselves. We all speak the same language. Many of the countries that you are from, there are different languages and dialects within your country. Before we made these bigger groupings, people would identify by their language group. Certainly, people used to identify by geography. We all live in this area. But it was in 1779 that Blumenbach invented, hear my language, invented the category of race. He said, and this was not just some ideas, this was science at the time. He said that, no, all human beings can be divided into five breeds, five types, five varieties. Caucasian, Mongolian, Ethiopian, American, and Malayan. He started that. Uh, now, this is a, a lovely Swedish gentleman by the name of Carl Linus. And he took the ideas that were swirling in the ether and the work by Blumenbach, and he decided to add, and, and I have to give a triggering warning right now, because what we're about to read is his words. This is how he took Blumenbach's work and then expanded on it. Well, if there are these different breeds, what are they like? What, 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 what are the tendencies? What are the traits? What are the characteristics? Again, this is not just fireside banter. This is not locker room talk. This was published science. Okay, here he goes. He uses his own words. Because, of course, us scientists and academics, we always have to change the words so we sound smarter and stuff, right? Okay, fine. The Americanus. Listen to him. Red. Choleric. That means gets angry quickly. Righteous. Black, straight, thick hair, stubborn. Watch out for the red people. They're stubborn, zealous, free, painting himself with red lines. He continues. Regulated by customs. That's, that's the breed of the Americans. That's, that's what they're like. That's what that race is like. He continues. The Europeans. Let's talk about what they are scientifically now. White, sanguine, that, that means happy, open, positive. Brawny, that means strong, with abundant long hair and blue eyes. Gentle, acute, inventive. Yes, they're smart, intelligent. They will, they will invent new things. Covered with closed vestments and governed by laws. That's the Caucasians. These people make decisions by law. They're not out there just being choleric and 
going with the customs. No, 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 no. They look at the facts of things. They look at the research. And then they come down to the legal position. And that's their culture by heredity. Okay. The Asiaticus. Again, I apologize. This is what he wrote. Yellow. Melancholic. That means, you know, kind of depressed and low and sad. Stiff. No oh, emotion. Where's the fun? Where's the, where's the life? Black hair. Dark eyes. Severe. Be careful if you cross an Asiaticus. They will never forget. Haughty. They're so, they're so proud. Greedy. Always trying to get more in the deal. Covered with loose clothing and ruled by opinions. There, there's no strong legal kind of foundation to this race. It's more just, you know, he said, she said, you know, whatever's going around. That's them. All right. Now, the Afa or Africanus. By the way, longest list for this group. Black. Phlegmatic. That means kind of meh. Passive, not really bothered. Not really active or not really proactive, relaxed, black, frizzled hair, but silken skin. Man, that stuff doesn't crack. Flat nose, tumbled lips. Now the females, now, now see, for, for the other groups, we're not trying to differentiate males and females, but, but when we come to Africa, we're going to go in scientifically though, right? This is what that is. The females without shame. On the other hand, mammary glands give milk abundantly. So, fun fact there, a crafty, sly, lazy, cunning, lustful. Now, you've got to watch out for them big bucks. You all know what they're thinking. Careless, anoints himself with grease, and governed by caprice. That means by just whim. There's no reason to it. There's no logic to it. It's not even opinion. It's not even custom. You know, the Africanus just wakes up in the morning and whatever is just flowing through the air, that's what they do. Again, friends, this was not just some opinion on a talk show. This was the science in the textbook. All right, let's keep moving. Along came a lovely man, a lovely Englishman, God save the Queen and all that, by the name of Charles Darwin. And he is again, he's, 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 a, he's, also, he's a doctor, he's a scientist, he's listening to the academic, the intellectual conversation, and he decides to add his piece. Because he's like, okay, this is a great idea, okay, I see the theory of race, that's interesting, the Caucasian and the Mongolian, etc., etc. And I see, Linus, how, what you've done there to, to attribute traits to the races, but we have to solve the problem, gentlemen, and that's right, it was gentlemen only at that time. We have to solve the problem, how did these races come to be the way they are? I said, I can help you. Have you heard of the theory of evolution? And he wrote a book called The Origin of the, Spe Origin of the Species, which is what we usually talk about. But what we don't talk about is the subtitle or the secondary title, The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or The Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. Darwin's theory was that in every species, the animals, the fish, the da, 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 there are favored races. There are certain, not all fish are equally strong. Not all buffalo and, and sort of cattle are equally good. Not all big cats are equally powerful. And not all humans are equally smart, intelligent either. So, there, what is the scientific mechanism that preserves the favored races? And for that, he postulated natural selection, which we don't have time to get into now, but another time maybe I'll talk about that. Now, there's a lovely Frenchman around the same time. His name is Arthur Gabineau. And he thought, listen, I need to, I need to, this is good. I love what we're cooking here, but I need to add some more science to this, right? And he said, okay, listen. He came to believe that late race created culture, okay? Very important point. There were some who have said, well, okay, 
some of these stereotypes, but couldn't it just be that culture, like where people live, how they grow up? Like, it's not based on race. Anyone who happened to be raised in that culture would probably have those tastes and likes. He said, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. It's not culture that, that creates the groups. It's the, it's the race itself that creates culture. And he was arguing that distinctions between the three, black, white, and yellow races, were natural barriers. He said, yeah, okay, we have a few others, but, but let's be clear, black, white and yellow, those are the three main groups. And he went on to say that race mixing breaks those barriers down and leads to chaos. And he also believed that the white race was superior to all others. So he said, listen, thank you, Darwin, thank you for the, for the scientific mechanism, but let me add this piece. Let's all remember that we've got to keep these groups by themselves, because if we don't, if we let them mix, there'll be chaos, and the weaker races will dilute the stronger race. All right. He thought that the white race that was superior corresponded to the ancient Indo-European culture, also known as Aryan. He was the first to make that connection. So if you've heard people talk about Aryan this, Aryan that, thank Gibbono. He was the guy who invented and added all of this. Then comes along Charles Darwin's cousin, Francis Galton. And he says, guys, you've been doing good, but I need to, I need to pull all this together. And we need to make an academic discipline that we can take all of our scientific findings and be able to clearly communicate it to the world. And so he created, invented the academic discipline of eugenics. Have you ever heard this word before? Some of you, maybe you haven't. Eugenics was an academic discipline. In other words, you could go at one point to Harvard University and study eugenics. It was a real thing. Not just Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, fill in the blanks. Okay. The meaning of it is to be well-born. What, what, was, what, was, what was Galton's kind of theory? He said this, listen, in basic terms. He says that disease, mental illness, first two maybe could make some sense. Poverty, even morality and criminality were hereditary. That was his argument. That since we now know for a scientific fact that there are races, and since we now know, thanks to Linus, as a scientific fact, that there are these different characteristics in these races, and since we now know, thanks to Darwin, that this comes through evolution, then obvious, and since we now know, thank you, Gano, that, that the white race is, is superior, and then there, is, there are these blocks that we must block from intermixing, then the obvious conclusion is that these characteristics of these races are hereditary. The reason why the black man is lazy is because he's born that way. The reason why the red man is, is so choleric and gets angrily easy is that's his DNA, that's his genetics, it's not his fault. The reason why the white race is superior and we invent things and we have created this great democracy in America is because we, we inherited this from our fathers. So he decided, listen, if we want to get rid of, I mean, think of the perfect society. No crime. No poverty. Don't you love the sound of that? No disease. No immorality. I mean, that almost sounds like heaven. How could we create heaven on earth? Galton figured it out. It's through eugenics. Humanity, he said, can be improved by the selective, that should say selective, forget the typo, selective breeding of fit people. That means the good ones, the ones with the good stock, the good breed. Fit people and the prevention of breeding by the unfit people. Friends, you do this on the farm all the time. You have a good, strong cow, produces a lot of milk. Very calm, docile. You wanna have new calves. Which, which cow do you allow to breed? You find a good, strong bull, come from good stock, virile, powerful. And you make sure that you get those two to breed. Why? Because then the offspring will inherit the characteristics. You've been doing it in the farm all the time. Goldson just made the logical leap to say, let's do this with the humans. 
Guys, why are we out here trying to talk to people and say, hey, maybe you want to think about not indulging in morality? We could make it easy. We could just breed it out. These ideas were not limited to the UK. That's where he was from. It spread through Europe and the Americas. Obviously, Hitler picked up on these ideas. But not just North America. This was also spread in Latin America. I wish we had time to unpack a lot of this, but we don't. In many Latin American countries, they operated a policy of, and I'm going I'm to butcher the Spanish, so, so, so I apologize in advance, but blanquimiento, or whitening, after colonial rule. So after Spain and Portugal finally let go of Latin countries, many of those countries then took these eugen... And again, understand, if, if, if we want to give a, a little piece of like grace to, to those people, this was science. This wasn't going in some room with a bunch of people in hoods going, man, I hate those N-words, let's get out there. No, no, no. This was going to the lecture hall with the academics and the wine and the, and the cultured people and they played Bach and Handel before it and then they had the scientific presentation. What developing nation wouldn't want to follow the best scientific ideas to, to, to progress? We do it right now, right? So this happened after colonial rule. This is what happened. In fact, there is an image by a, a painter, a Spanish painter, uh, whose name is Modesto um, Bracos, uh, Bracos, I think I'm saying, I'm, I'm butchering it, in, in 1895, who was in Brazil. And he painted this picture. And the name of the picture, and if you listen to last week's sermon, it's going to make sense. Well, our Brazilian pastor grew up in New York, Pastor Felipe said he heard. This picture is called The Redemption of Ham. You remember Pastor Felipe said that he, he heard growing up that, that, that black people were, Ham was cursed to become black, and that's what the black people are. Here was this picture of the, of the, of the policy of whitening in Brazil, and here we have the, the black, the African grandmother, and look at, look at her. She's worshiping the Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for the blessing on my life, because she has had a mixed-race daughter. Now, now, the husband is not, the father's not in the picture. And we, if we had time, we could talk about that. But by God's grace, she's raised that daughter by herself. And praise the Lord Jesus. That daughter has attracted the attention of a wonderful white husband. And they've had a son who's white. And so Ham's curse has been removed. Ham's race has been redeemed by the beautiful truth of well-breeding eugenics. This is what they did. And if you take the time to think about it, and you look at the phenotypes of our Latin brothers and sisters, you can see the evidence of this policy. At that time, they invited millions of Europeans to emigrate to these countries for free to Whiten them. But here's where <laughs> the chicken, as it were, has to come home to roost. This is, this is actually apparent. Because right now we're talking about a lot of stuff out there. And it could be easy for us as Adventist Christians to say, well, that's, that's good, that's true, Pastor. But what does that have to do with us? Well, here's the part that is really disturbing and sad. You've heard of the man, John Harvey Kellogg. How many of you ate some of his cereal this morning. <laughs> As Adventists, we have kind of a, a proud relationship with him. We know that after a while he left the church and did some weird stuff, but man, we, you know, he, an Adventist invented Kellogg's cornflakes. That's the health message at work. I mean, they added sugar and messed it up, but, but, but the point is we mean something. Adventism has added to the great story of, of the world in America. The Battle Creek Sanitarium where they implemented the principles of the health message in the vision that Ellen White had. Wow, we love that history. This is an article I found, written January 9th this year by the Battle Creek Inquirer. Forgive me, it's cut off, but you can go to their website, Google it. Battle Creek Inquirer. The, the title is, How Harvey Kellogg Was Wrong on Race. I'm going to read a few quotes from this, just for the sake of ease. Here it goes. Forgive me, it's small. It's the best I could do. Screenshot it if you're at home on your device and enlarge it and you can. Kellogg's support of eugenics 
was tepid to begin with. It means in the beginning, he wasn't, like, he wasn't completely sure about the whole eugenics thing. I mean, he's a doctor, right? So he's in the academic world. He's seeing, reading all the papers, reading all the books. This, this is the latest cutting edge science. And, but at first he wasn't sure. He continues. Likely, why was he tepid? Likely due to eugenics ties to Darwinism and his connection to the Seventh-day Adventist church, which teaches a literal interpretation of the six-day creation story in Genesis. In other words, he liked some of the ideas, but he couldn't buy all the way into it because he's like, but what about Darwin? And I'm an Adventist. We believe in creation, and he doesn't believe in that. And so if he's teaching these eugenic ideas or if they're connected to him, then maybe I shouldn't do it. But then, Brother Kellogg received insight from the Lord. And he wrote it down in a book called The Living Temple. And in that book, he started to play with some different kind of ideas about humanity's true nature. Wish I had time to get into it, but I don't. But what this book allowed him to do, and by the way, the Spirit of God through the, the message and ministry of Ellen White warned him repeatedly to not go down this road, but he didn't listen. What this book allowed him to do was to give himself a spiritual bridge to these scientific ideas. So he was able to somehow, with one hand, kind of hold on to his faith, but also make space in another hand for him to hold on to these new popular ideas. And eventually, of course, we know what happened. He, he ended up letting go completely of his faith and, and going with, with the science. <clears throat> it wasn't the article. This was not written by an Adventist. But it's true. It wasn't until his break from the church in 1907 that he began to truly embrace the ideas. Here's just, here's, here's just a quick preaching point. <clears throat> I know that the Adventist church at times can be annoying, it can seem slow, it can seem backward. I know that sometimes Christianity in the Bible itself can somehow just seem like ridiculous in times like this. And there are so many more powerful and exciting ideas and movements and groups out there. But there is something about standing with God. That even when you don't understand it, and even when the greatest thinkers can't comprehend it, it can keep you from going off the cliff. So when he lost his connection to the church, he then fully invested in these new ideas. What happened next? Kellogg combined his belief in euthenics, the improvement of human functioning by improvement of human conditions, to come up with his own brand of eugenics he referred to as race betterment. You know what he did? He took the health message and mixed it with eugenics. And he came up with his own brand called Race Betterment. Keep going. The things, he had the things he had advocated avoiding through his biologic living, meat and alcohol, were deemed race poisons. Right? Meat poisons the race. Okay, let's keep going. <laughs> Help us, Jesus. The idea of racial suicide popularized by President Theodore Roosevelt was the notion that middle and upper class white Americans were being outbred by inferior races, primarily, now see, friends, you, you, please don't miss this, primarily southern and eastern Europeans Blacks and Asians, I wish I had time, but go and do some research on eugenics. This wasn't just a, oh, we hate black folk thing, or oh, we hate Asians. They had categories of white folk, and there were immigration laws which made it more difficult to immigrate to the United States if you were not from Northern Europe, Germany, Britain, and Scandinavia. We literally are across the street from Swedish Covenant Hospital as I preach this right now. There were laws that said there were quotas for you if you were from Italy, if you were from Spain, if you were from Portugal, and if, God forbid, you dared to be from Eastern Europe, if you were Romanian or Polish or Slavic, they didn't want you here because, yeah, you might be Caucasian, but you're, I mean, you're not at the top of the tree. So be careful how quickly you say, oh, this, this is an issue for other folk. No, 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 no. This issue may have in fact impacted your own family. And they said, we've we got we to we keep those southern and eastern Europeans and obviously the blacks and Asians from mixing with the, with the pure middle class and upper class Americans here. Kellogg advocated 
that whites return to biological living and avoid race mixing. Kellogg did that. Let's keep going. Watch this. Kellogg's scientific racism was at times at odds with his personal attitudes. What's the point? Kellogg was not mean. Kellogg did not go around calling people the N-word. Kellogg was not out there with tiki torches shouting white power. He was, like, he was a nice guy. In fact, especially when it came to African Americans, he rejected segregation of blacks at his sanitarium. I've often heard us talk proudly about how, how at the Battle Creek Sanitarium, they served both blacks and whites. See, that's, that's Kellogg, our boy. Yes. <laughs> They trained African-American doctors and nurses there. He and his wife, Ella Eaton, fostered more than 40 children, among them African-Americans and children from Latin America. What's the point? You can have a good heart, but have a broken head when it comes to the issues of race. I am coming against the notion right now that racism is primarily an emotional thing a person has in their heart. I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. That's true and that's racism too. But the real issue is structural, intellectual, academic, and in, in, put into policies and laws, racism. Ideas based on the categories, the false categories of race. Watch what happens next. Still, Kellogg did not hold African Americans, African Americans as a race in high esteem. Here are some of his words. The intellectual inferiority of the Negro male to the European male is universally acknowledged. Now, can, can, I, can I upset you right now? He wrote that in 1902 while he was still an Adventist. So he went to church on Sabbath, talked about the coming of the Lord Jesus, ate a good vegan lunch, went for a walk, and then wrote, now we all know that like those black guys aren't nearly as smart as us white guys. While training black people in his school. And if anyone had asked him, Caleb, man, you know, some of your stuff on eugenics, I'm not, I'm not really... What well, should I believe in that? What would he have said? Are, you, are you, you accusing me? Do you know how many black people I've Do you know how many people we've fostered? Do you know? Friends, what if racism is not primarily about what you feel in your heart? What if it could be the unconscious and sometimes conscious beliefs of your mind? Let's continue. We're almost done. Sorry, this is so small. Screenshot. Can we honestly say that there is a bit of white supremacy? We, sorry, we can honestly say that there is a bit of white supremacy in this, Wilson said. He was very concerned, Kellogg went to speaking about now, with Asians. Or the yellow peril. I'm reading the words he wrote. He was very concerned Asians, and especially the Chinese, would be able to outcompete the West. And I, I, I wish that this ancient history didn't ring so true to what's happening right now. He says, if we don't deal with this, what's that? The, the yellow peril. We're going to be ruled by Orientals in the future. Friends, believe it or not, it gets worse. In terms of positive eugenics, the encouragement of the fit to reproduce, Kellogg advocated for a eugenics registry. Why do you have to put down what your race is when you're trying to just get a, a license for your car? Like, 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 what does your race have to do with how well you can drive a car? Friends, at one point in time, based, based on eugenic ideas, the country decided to start creating race registries, which he advocated for, for the purpose of establishing racial thoroughbreds. You know, those pure, pure folk. And called for medical records to be considered before marriage. 
he also was in favor of sterilization of defectives, particularly criminals. And while working on the Michigan Board of Health, Kellogg promoted a eugenics agenda to the state legislature. Can we follow the train, the, the daisy chain here? So Bob and Buck said there are races. They exist. It's not just tribes and languages, it's, there's these categories. Then along came Linus and said, yes, and these races have certain qualities. Among them, the Africanists are especially prone to criminality. Then along came Darwin and said, listen, we've got to explain how this came. It came through evolution, through natural selection. In other words, it's hereditary. Then along came uh, um, <clears throat> Gano, who said, Gibbonneau, rather, who said, listen, that's so true, and we're going to make sure that we keep the main three, the white, the black, and, and, and the yellow apart, and especially make sure that we recognize that the white is superior. Then along came Galton, who said, listen, let's put this all into an academic discipline. We'll call it eugenics. And then along came Kellogg and others, but we're talking about our mess right now, who said, listen, we're going to make sure that we keep a registry so that we can keep thoroughbreds. And listen, I'm, I'm, I'm so passionate about us not having the defectives, which, by the way, also included anyone who had any kind of mental illness. I'm, I'm, I think we should sterilize them medically, especially the criminals. Who are the criminals? And he got the Michigan Board of Health to promote this at the state legislature. He got laws created based on his eugenic, racist, white supremacist ideology. I'm not just saying these words because they're buzzwords right now. That's the technical definition of what that is. Watch what happened next. We're almost done. The legislature passed it. <laughs> Public Health, Public Act 34, 1913, an act to authorize the sterilization of mentally defective persons, at least 3,800 people in that state were involuntarily sterilized, according to research done by Kate O'Connor. So it's not just that he had these ideas. It's not just that he had a group with friends and when no one was looking, they used to make bad jokes about people. It's not just that he got actual laws that resulted in actual people having real doctors take actual surgical instruments and cutting uh, their, their reproductive organs so that they wouldn't reproduce because they were of the wrong stock. Friends, this is what people are talking about when they say black lives matter. Now, I know that, that for some of you, and by the way, did you notice how Maddox in the 70s, in the 70s, in the 70s already had the language of all lives? Did you notice that? The idea that, listen, I, let's not just talk about one single group's issues. Let's just talk about all the groups, and then if all the groups have success, then hopefully every group can figure it out. But the issue is that there used to be actual laws that favored and disserved some groups based on actual science they believed promoted by people including one of our own. And when Kellogg left the church, did we suddenly all get the good news that there's no longer slave nor free or, or male or female or Greek or Gentile? Did we all get that? Is, there, is it possible that some of this thinking found its way into the fact that for a long time, if you were black, though you could go to the sanitarium, you couldn't go to Emmanuel College, later Andrews University? Is, is that possible? Is it possible that as Adventism grew among African Americans and they became a more prominent part of the church that the decision was made to create a separate conference. Because what if you have a spirit-filled, thank you Lord, young black man go to camp meeting and meet a spirit-filled young black woman and across Bible study 
They need eyes. And what, if, what, if that, what if that starts to weaken the race? My Lord. Eugenics informed government policy in immigration. Wish I had time, but I'm already over. Citizenship laws. Do you know that until 1950, Filipino immigrants could not become citizens in this country? Like, by law. That's 1950s, guys. Like, one of our matriarchs here, Sister Petronila, is 90. Like, she lived when that was a thing. We're not talking about, like, when Noah was a boy. It, introduced, it, it influenced redlining laws in cities. See, in the South, they had Jim Crow, but, but here in Chicago, they had redlining, which meant we can't legally segregate, but we can keep certain groups in certain neighborhoods by law. As well as policing. If there are some groups that are more prone to, to criminality, and again, pl please hear me on this. You may not have a racist bone in your body. Some of your best friends may be from whoever race. But if you are living in a country that believes scientifically that some races are more prone to criminality, what if you are a logical thinking person, where do you put most of your resources policing-wise? And it just makes sense. And to argue that none of this is affecting what's happening today, I believe it's just not true to the evidence. The effects of this is still with us today, both in society and in the unconscious beliefs of people about the race. By the way, that's not just white people. That's all people. All of us unconsciously still believe this. One of the things that hurts me most, I'm going to be honest in this place, Lord, is that I am afraid of big black men. And I'm one. Do you understand the cognitive dissonance that that is? When I have to literally tell myself when I'm somewhere and I meet a big, strong, young, athletic black man that I don't know, that he's not a threat. If I have to do that, I'm speaking to my, my lighter skinned brothers and sisters, please tell me the therapy you took that removed that completely from your heart. Because I want it. We're all victims of this. And so to pretend like it's done with and it's gone away with, it, it, we, it doesn't help us to move forward. Racism is sin. Period. And if you or I have this in our heart, again, I'm not saying you don't like people. I'm saying the thinking, the concepts, even, even the, the, the last remnants of the idea that there are these differences, you need to take it to the Lord to have him remove it. You need to educate yourself so it can be removed. Last two Bible texts. 1 John 1 verse 9. What does the Bible says, say? The Bible says, thank you Jesus for your grace. If we confess our sins. That feeling that you get and you think about your beautiful daughter, one day when she gets older and she can choose to marry someone, and she marries someone that doesn't look like your people, yeah, if we confess our sins, that feeling that you get, that, that, that thought process that you get, that there are some people you have to be more careful of, that sin. The sin that you have stood by and seen laws that benefited you and did not benefit your brothers and sisters, but you did not say anything because it was working for you. That sin. The sin of being too afraid to speak about things because you're worried that you won't be accepted when you know it's true, I'm going to confess that sin. If we confess our sins, the Bible promises us that he, that is Jesus, is faithful and just 
to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But there's one more. There's one more text and then we're done. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel chapter 9. Daniel has had a vision that he doesn't understand. Stuff is going on prophetically. He has been told it, but he doesn't fully know how to make sense of it. And he's praying. And in his prayer, he is confessing. Notice this. He is confessing not simply the things that he himself personally did, but he is also confessing the sins of his ancestors. Because there is a biblical precedent and mandate that I can confess to God for stuff that maybe I didn't do, but my daddy did, or my granddad did, or my grandma did. That's okay. And look what happens. He's confessing his sins. We're going to read. We don't have time to read it all. But in verse 20 to 22, it says this. Now, while I was speaking, praying, and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, for the holy mountain of my God, verse 21. Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, whom I had seen in the vision at the beginning, being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offering. And he informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. Friends, there are some things that we will not understand, that God will not give us skill to understand. There are some issues that we will not be given power to solve until, like Daniel, we confess our sin, yes, and the sin of our people. Whether that be our church history people, whether that be our personal family history people, whether that be our nation history people, whether that be our cultural... I don't, I don't know what the group is, but, but unless we are honest and humble ourselves before God, there are some blessings we won't receive. And aren't you tired living in Babylon? Yeah, I know we make the best of it, but aren't you tired living in a world in a system which is ultimately against God? Don't you want to escape? We're going to do what Daniel did. I know this is a hard message. Maybe this is why we're quarantining, because no one's here to take me and put me off a cliff. Plus, it's pretty flat in Illinois, so I'll be good. But this is what the Bible is teaching us. This is why we're here. I'm not saying that everything about American history was just bad and wrong. And I'm not saying that if you're proud to be American, then you're just the worst racist in the world. But I'm saying we have to be honest about what has happened. We have to be honest about what was done and what hasn't been done. And we have to be honest with God about the thoughts, the feelings of our own heart. Trusting that he will forgive that he will heal. Let's pray. Father God, I've done my best to present your word today. I'm almost, no, I am certain. There are many things that I didn't say right. I'm certain that almost everyone listening to me can think of something that they didn't like when I said it that way. Some of them think I did, I should have mentioned this. Some of them said I shouldn't have mentioned it. But I did my best to put before my family that I love the truth of how we are where we are, of how we got here. But Lord, we need you to send an angel to show us how we can move forward. Lord, I want to thank you. I'm going to brag on us right now. We aren't perfect. We've had our own, and if we had time, we could talk about the racial issues we've had here at North Shore, but I want to thank you that we've been ahead of the curve. But Lord, we don't want to just stagnate where we are. We want to go on to the real unification of the family of Adam and Eve, where we can all look each other in the eye and genuinely know that we are brothers and sisters made in the image of God. Lord, I pray for those who are part of our church family who feel that them, their family, their people have been especially oppressed and disadvantaged and who feel rightly that the church has all too often been silent. 
and help them to know that you are not impassive when it comes to injustice, that it makes you upset. When I pray for the beautiful members of this church who may now be feeling this strange dissonance just a week after we celebrated America and Independence Day, that our lovely British pastor who we like has kind of just thrown manure on all of our history and our heritage. Now, is this turning into some Black Lives Matter social justice church? Well, what's going on? I pray for that brother and that sister, that you would help them to understand not so much my intent, but the intent of Scripture. And that you would guide them through what is, I understand, a painful experience of maybe rethinking and reevaluating your identity in order to find it in you in Christ. Lord, only you can do that because as we look at the world, we sure know they don't have the answers even if they are right, asking valid questions. And Lord, if it fails here, then where can it succeed? So help us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.